Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. CMO Confidential takes you behind the scenes to look at all the decisions, choices, politics, and drama that go with the most intense job, or one of the most intense jobs in the executive suite, and that is whoever is running marketing. I'm Mike Linton, the former chief marketing officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here with Max Racklin of private equity. And we're going to talk today about private equity and the difference between private equity and public companies and what that means to the marketer. Welcome, Max. Good to be here, Mike. Max, now Max is a managing director at Lightyear Capital. That, as we said, is a private equity firm that partners with growth companies at the nexus of Max, and Max wants me to say this, at the nexus of financial services, technology, healthcare, and business services. Max is, of course, a member of Lightyear's investment committee, and he currently serves on the board of five companies. He also worked at Goldman Sachs, was a consultant at Willis Towers Watson, and it must also be pointed out that Max has a bunch of fancy degrees from Cornell and a very fine university called Duke, where other people on this call went to. Today's topic is aligning with your private equity owner how private equity investors really wish marketing departments would approach the relationship. And here's the setup. Private equity funds have surged over the last decade. Uh, There's a lot of funds and private equity always comes in with an investment thesis on how it will pay back its investors. The marketing department and its budget are often super critical to this thesis and a also includes things like a total addressable market, marketing efficiency, acquisition, and importantly, how are you going to return this money to your investor? So Max here is going to talk about that because this is an added complication to me for, to the chief marketing officer job. And we know that the chief marketing officer job is the fastest churning job in the C-suite. And I think private equity probably makes that a little hotter, makes the seat a little hotter. Max, can you give our listeners an overview of private equity and how they approach investments? I'm happy to do that, Mike. I mean, first, it's important to understand, you know, private equity is a huge industry. I mean, just to put it in context, at the end of 22, there was nearly $2 trillion of capital raised globally in what we commonly term as dry powder or capital that's available to make investments. And that figure is about a quarter of all the capital the private equity firms have under management. With the that rest, is a ton of money. That is a ton of money with the rest already invested in companies. And as you said, you know, there are lots of firms. Actually, there's over 18,000 firms around the world. And while they all have the same purpose, which is to be good stewards for the capital that's entrusted to them, there's no surprise that they all go about investing that capital somehow differently. And maybe I'll provide you a bit of context on the way we do it. Our approach starts with identifying long-term secular trends that are often based in demographic, regulatory, or technological changes. Hey Max, give us an example of that. Sure. You know, one very significant trend in the United States is individuals being responsible for their own retirement. In this country, unlike in other countries in Europe, you know, the defined benefit plans have gone away. So now you've got defined contribution, people are putting money aside for when they retire. They are retiring with a significant amount of, you know, hopefully time before they pass away. And they're looking to figure out, how are they gonna see their grandkids twice a year? How are they gonna live within their means? And, you know, as our founder many years ago said, we've turned into a bit of a country of pension fund managers unequipped for the job. So as you're seeing this trend, this silver tsunami of retirement, we think about what are the types of businesses that benefit from those trends? Well, one example of a business that benefits from those trends is those businesses that help individuals manage their wealth post-retirement, wealth management firms, both on the planning as well as on the investment side. And then when we identify the trends and the types of businesses, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what are the key differentiators among them. And then to have an investment, we get together with the management team and we put in the terms of a value creation plan. And these value creation plans 
have very proven levers that are repeatable, measurable, scalable in terms of returns. Thank you. Uh, full disclosure, Max and I serve on a board together. So I get to see Max in action and he has something to watch, I'm just saying. So, so Max, thank you for the overview on, on uh, private equity. Can you write the marketer, uh, the marketing component into this story now? Like, it, so you're looking at, at, at all these different companies and a lot of them have pretty big marketing lines or have a marketing, marketing as part of the thesis. Write the marketer into the story, would you? Yeah, well, I think the first question that we are starting with is how does marketing and whether marketing fits into the value creation plan that we jointly agreed with management? And it almost always does. And keep in mind, as you all know, you know, these value creation plans are discussed on a quarterly basis at the board of directors meeting. And each element has lots of sub areas of focus and multiple people tasked with executing it. So assuming marketing is part of the plan, and as I said, it almost always is, then the question becomes, you know, how does the head of marketing or whoever's presenting at the board of directors meeting express the spend? express the related milestones associated with that spend and express the returns that are expected from the spend over the course of the investment. And how long is an investment, but usually Max, because you know, one of the things you hear about private equity is they don't have a very long-term time horizon. They're almost always looking at the marketing budget the second they arrive, sometimes even before they arrive. And you know, and how you are all portrayed on television is not as like the nicest folks. So, so like, tell us about, about that. And, and then we'll go into, we'll go into measures. Fair enough. We look at everything before we arrive. Uh, I think that's part of, part of uh, our, our job mandate is to, is to best understand before you make an investment, the totality of, of the thesis. And that's how the evaluation plan comes to be. But I think, the point you raise is one we hear all the time and maybe taking a step back, like it's debatable how long private equity has been around, but I think you and I can both agree <laughs> the industry has been around for a long, long time. And despite that, and there's this pervasive misunderstanding that private equity focuses on short term results at the expense of long term value creation. And I would suggest that short term results are really the purview of public company where the management team has to get up on an earnings call quarterly. And then the next day, the stock market moves, depending on, you know, whether those quarterly metrics have been met. That is not the case in private equity. Each of our investment funds, to answer your question directly, is 10 years in duration. And that could be extended to 12 years. And I would say 12 years is not short term. I think in addition, you know, the way we generate returns for our investors is when we exit our stake. And when we're exiting our stake, we're typically exiting our stake to either other private equity firms or to strategic buyers. If those buyers don't see long-term growth potential, the price at which we exit will reflect it. So the, the success of our investment is very much tied to being able to build an enterprise that continues to grow long after we're no longer uh, investors in the business. And look, I can think of four instances, at least maybe five, where we've spent a lot of time on areas that you can't necessarily measure their return during the investment. Uh, brand building is, is, is certainly one of them. You know, you know, typically that happens when we carve a business out. We have to stand it up. We can have a brand, so you have to put one in place. Sometimes that also happens when, as you mentioned, before the investment, you know, we spend time on diligence and together with the company, we realize that maybe the brand's tired. Maybe it's not resonating with a target customer, and that's when we're sitting down you're looking at the marketing budget and the budget will have both measurable tangible metrics you know and returns but also has to have room for experimentation and it has to have room for the cmo and that function to stretch because in the end after we exit our stake we're going to stand there and we're going to say how did each part of the value creation plan including marketing create value to do just that you know what are the real tangible pecuniary results that we were able to achieve. So, hey, hey Max, so tell me when the, the chief marketing officer comes in or the marketing department comes in and they're showing you all these measures, there is also the underlying financial measures. How, what is the best advice you can give the marketers to present 
the marketing data to a bunch of folks that are essentially financial first listeners. Yeah, I think one key element of, of private equity investing is realizing that our expertise is business building, but our expertise is not the underlying function, often not the underlying function that is part of business building, particularly marketing. And very rarely are private equity investors marketing experts. Uh, we bring I'm not going to say anything funny here, but I really want to, Max. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's your show. <laughs> Take it Go away. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. You're just saying that you guys are rarely marketing experts. So keep going. So I think the first area of focus for the CMO, and frankly, everyone in the C suite, is to focus on communication. As simply as possible, explain the goal. And how is that goal going to tie to the overall value creation plan? And how are we going to measure? whether we're succeeding along this journey. Don't be afraid to think big. Don't be afraid to think long-term. But if you think big, you gotta show up with big results. So we also expect that not everything's gonna go well during the entire investment period. So it's important to be direct. Bad news first, then the solution. Let's get together and, and, and work on pivoting you know, from whatever issue we may, that may arise together. And often, you know, kind of going back to a point you were making earlier about public company context, private company context, CMOs don't have that freedom in the public company context. Well, you do have that freedom in the private company context. And, and it only really works out well when that communication is in place. Hey, I want to go back to, I, I, you made, a, I think, a super important point that I don't want to gloss over, which is the <laughs> bad news first point. Because one of the things I think ha can happen with marketers is, they want to tell you how good it is or it's going to be. And what I hear you saying is you don't want to hear that. What you really want to hear is, uh, you know, really, you, you just want to get right into the things you can fix or are going to make things better. Ta can you talk a little more about that? And am I interpreting that right? I think you are interpreting that right. It's in, when we first get together, we're going to agree on how, you know, what this amazing future that we're going to build together is going to look like. But typically, you know, the, one of the reasons private equity firm is there to begin with is either to you know, cr fix some areas that, that need fixing or invest in areas that have been underinvested or provide additional resources, bring in individuals who are in our network with expertise to help supercharge the business. So that means our long-term dream isn't going to happen tomorrow and we're going to make mistakes together along the way. Uh, the worst thing that can ha happen is if we're not really being clear up front with each other of how it's going. I mean, the expectation that everything is going to go up and to the right during the entire investment period is just a fallacy. I wish that had happened just once in my career, but it hasn't. <laughs> uh. And the worst thing that happens is if there's an obfuscating of the facts, because then you don't have the opportunity to get it course correct. In those instances, you know, if, if there isn't really that clear communication, people aren't sure of what's going on, and then private equity, you know, often gets a little bit nervous about not having their arms around the issue. That's when personnel changes occur. And can I follow on with that? When the investment thesis is going south, it's not working like you'd like it. Yeah. What should the marketer do in that kind of situation? Solutions, solutions, solutions. Uh, you know, going back to the conversation that we're having earlier, they're experts. They are the experts in their field. This is what they've dedicated their life. To, to, to doing, so appreciating that things aren't going well and saying, look, what, what can we do to right the ship? And, and I, I don't want to gloss over this point because I think this is super important. I hear you saying, I don't want a lot of explanations as to why it's going badly. I want, I want what we are going to do to do our best. I mean, is that right? I, not, not exactly. I mean, I think everything starts with, you know, for lack of a better term, an audit. Yeah. You know, you, you, you've got to diagnose the patient before right. you can prescribe medication. So you can't start with solutions unless you understand the, the underlying issue. The, but I think that there's a need to appreciate that most board members, you know, either have very short attention spans or just a fundamental, you know, lack of depth in the function. You've got to bring it to 10,000 feet as quickly as possible and say, look, here are the issues. We either, you know, are 
selling our product to someone who would also want to buy it. And we haven't, we don't fully understand who wants to buy it, or we're not doing a good job reaching to that constituent. And here's how we know that's the case. All of a sudden, everyone's now aligned. Okay, we get the issue together. What are we going to do about it? Well, let's, you know, hire someone to come in and really figure out who's going to buy our product and what's the best way to reach them and how to do that in this region or that region. Great. Everyone aligned? How much is it going to cost? It's going to cost the following amount. Well, how are we going to measure if we're successful? Here's the two or three operating metrics that are going to tell us that we're now reaching our target audience and that they're now, you know, have the proclivity to actually buy our product. Great. Next quarter, let's see how we're done. Following quarter, let's see how we've done and so on and so forth. Okay, so if I'm a CMO and I'm being recruited from a public company into a private equity CMO gig or marketing gig, what are things I should be thinking about? And what is some advice you could give someone like that uh, who's thinking about that to say, is this going to be a good fit for me or not? Yeah. I think the, the first piece is to, it's to really ask yourself, am I comfortable being... I wouldn't necessarily say on the hot seat, but am I comfortable being on the team where I am now regularly um, responsible for a function? Or, and, and not just responsible for a function to someone higher up, but I can go and explain to the board how we all together, all stakeholders, are going to benefit. Lay out a clear plan. I think the other, the other big change is, you know, oftentimes, private equity firms that the you know while we almost always grow the businesses that we invest in from a headcount perspective you're still running pretty lean so how do i make the most with with the limited resources that i have i used to have all these individuals uh and some people could skate by and you know and and, and others were were subsidizing you know, the whole function now everyone's going to be responsible everyone's going to have to really perform and I want the best team I can have. And that doesn't necessarily mean I need the greatest number of people or the most amount of money. But how am I going to be creative? And how am I going to pull my weight in order to really reach these returns? Because at the end of the investment period, there is this big pot of gold, you know, at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> and and all stakeholders get to benefit. So how you know, seeing yourself align. Um and, and, you know, not as this is my function, that is your function, but this is our collective role. Thanks for that. If, if I'm a CMO and I can't really speak financial, yeah. is that a stopper for me in PE? Because, you, well, you, you, know, you know, you can get into all the, all the nice brand metrics like awareness, consideration, you know, even repeat purchase and everything else. But if I can't translate in that into financial numbers or hold my own financially, should I stay away from PE? You know, the knee jerk reaction, and I think it's a, a bit of a leading question, you know, would be yes, but I, I, I would say not necessarily yet. You know, what is financial? Uh, I think you know, for us, oftentimes the financial results are just that, they're outputs. They're outputs of operating metrics. You're a professional CMO, you should be comfortable with KPIs, marketing KPIs. And if you can work with the finance team in translating how the operating metrics convert into financial metrics, then you're good to go. You know, the operating KPIs are the inputs. And if, 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 if you're quantitatively oriented, and if you can articulate the two, three, four, five operating inputs that are critical, then absolutely private equity is, is a great career because you know the translating the operating metrics into financial metrics, that you know, we can supplement that. Great. Thank you. How about, you know, you said the funds are 10 to 12 years. If I if if you're you're purchasing a, a company late in the fund, like year five or six, and I'm a CMO and I have a long-term idea, like a loyalty program or some sponsorship that's going to run past that, how do I present that late in the fund? I know this is kind of a corner question, but I think it's probably important to a lot of CMOs out there when they're looking at long-term, short-term, and then where they are in the fund. Yeah, I would take out the, the, the worry about when in the fund investments made. That has got nothing to do 
uh, from our perspective of how long we hold the asset. You know, our investments will be as long as it needs to be in order for all stakeholders to generate the return that we are promising to our investors. And, you know, oftentimes the first five years are an investment period, the next five years are um, a harvesting period. So even if you're coming in at the end of the first five, there's still five to seven years of investment horizon in a fund. And if we need to hold it longer in order to generate an appropriate return, we will. So setting aside when you're coming in is I think the most important thing. The question is what's the best thing for this business? And what's the best thing for this business long term? So I'll give you an example. Sometimes, you know, we think about building businesses from regional to national. And oftentimes marketing, you know, nationally is not going to bear fruit in the short right. term. You're going into a region, nobody knows you in that region, you gotta spend, you're not sure whether you should be spending you know, through whatever channels actually going to work in that region, uh, you have to experiment. But the ability to show green shoots is going to be super valuable to the next buyer because they're going to say, look, you were very successful in the region you started with. Then you enter this new region and you've got a repeatable, measurable, scalable effort to grow marketing, awareness, and branding and client acquisition in that new region. Granted, it's not at scale, but you've put in the foundational investments. That's perfectly fine, but you've got to tell us, the board, what those green shoots look like. I, I think this is, uh, this is a super <laughs> important point, which is if I have a proof point that marketing will work, even if it's in a region, the next buyer can buy it, take it in their long time horizon, and then when their model will be the expansion of that marketing. But you have to have a proof point that can sell. You can't have a proof point that is judgmental unless it is so overwhelming that the, any buyer could see it. Well, uh, I think you have to put your shoes in, you have to put yourself in the shoes of that next buyer. What are they going to want to see? What proof points are they going to want? And that could be a strategic buyer, could be a private equity buyer, could be whatever. What do they care about? Uh, and then go back and engineer your path there. If you can't articulate that, then it's going to be very difficult to convince investors to back it. Yeah, to, to, to back up the truck and dump a pile of money on, 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 the, uh, on the purchase. Hey, uh, so Max, uh, can you tell us any interesting or funny story about marketing and private equity, you know, without like incriminating anyone, but can you tell us anything that would be interesting to our listeners just as a, a little fun fact or a fun story that you'd want to share? And I, I'm just, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of this instance and, and it was actually marketing specific that, that happened a couple of years ago. Now, as, as I mentioned, you know, private equity professionals, we're not, most of us are not marketing specialists. And that goes in spades uh, when you talk about branding. You know, if you're not a marketing specialist, you're sure not a branding specialist. And when you combine kind of the idea of, 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 of branding, which is, is not necessarily easy to measure, with private equity's desire to measure everything, uh, ridiculous things ensue. And I'm thinking back this one time after a very long board meeting, we were sitting in executive session. And at this session, we're going through the, uh, the logo. This is brand new logo. It's been through tons of people have looked at it, experts. It, it's final. And there's not really much to debate. This is it. <laughs> and, and, and one individual around the board said, you know, I don't think that this, and, and the logo is a C, because I don't think the distance between the top of the C and the bottom <laughs> of the C is proportional to the thickness of the C. And gets into this heated debate with the CEO, and by the way, neither the CEO nor this individual know a, a thing about, about branding other than what they think they know about branding, which isn't all that much. And it gets to a point where like one of them pulls out a ruler and they really <laughs> measure and you know there's 10 people in the room and the two of them are in such a engaged discussion that they don't notice that the other eight are rolling around on the floor you know belly laughing and i think it, you know it goes to to the point that that i was making earlier you know you can't forget that there really are professionals who dedicate their entire lives in 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 in, in the furtherance of their their trade and 
you know, it is it is important to rely on these individuals, uh, question and push them, but ultimately, you know, stick to your knit. <laughs> well, all right. Well, Max, I, I'll give you a chance to anything else you want to share with our listeners before we sign off. Look, uh, I really appreciate uh, spending time with you as always. I, I think you know the one thing if I could leave you with is just um, you know, the, the understanding that private equity and the management team and all stakeholders need to be aligned, need to be on the same side of the table. And if that's going to be the case, then great things will ensue and you'll create a lot of value for all stakeholders. Well, thanks, Max. And thanks to our listeners for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for our other shows, which include Why the Short Shelf Life of CMOs, Parts 1, 2, 3, and 4, Will the Obsession with mark, uh, with Measurement Destroy the Marketing Function, uh, and then What It's Like to Be in the B2B Startup World as a Marketer. And this is Mike Linton signing off. All you marketers, stay safe out there. Thank you, Max. You're welcome.